Okay, good morning or better good afternoon to everybody. Welcome to this uh, final workshop uh, of the EFSA Summer School. And of course, it is much more intimate, I would say, than uh, the morning session. We are, uh, let's say, a restricted group. Uh, and today we'll be discussing, I hope, uh, and also Giovanni and me will try to feed a bit to the discussion uh, beside the, the two presentations that we have uh, in program. Uh, about novel food and technologies. But before starting, we would like to uh, share, everybody, uh, a very short presentation, or not only of Giovanni and me, but everybody, a uh, couple of words of uh, who we are and what we are doing uh, in life. Very short one. So I will start myself. I'm Stefano Sforza. I'm from the University of Parma, actually. I'm here. I'm a full professor of organic chemistry at the Department of Food and Drug. And uh, all my research, actually, I'm a protein chemist. So all my research concern proteins, also including uh, recovery and valorization of protein from waste, uh, marginal biomasses, uh, uh, study of uh, new sources of protein, and whatever you might think is related uh, to the, the things that we heard today. So that's it. The ball to you, Giovanni. Thank you, Stefano. Welcome to everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, well, yeah, just a, a, a brief uh, housekeeping, uh, this uh, workshop will be recorded, this recording, so just to let you know to everyone. Uh, and um, I'm a colleague of Stefano from the University of Parma. Uh, I'm an agricultural economist uh, with a focus on consumers' uh, behavior. So um, I'm a colleague with, uh, of, of Professor Davide Menozzi, and together uh, we do research on uh, consumer acceptance, consumer perception, willingness to pay, and other uh, measures about how we choose and how we behave towards foods. And among the different foods category, uh, novel food has been uh, um, one of those. And uh, recently we, we focus mainly on edible insects, for example, and uh, we have done an extensive uh, work uh, investigating the factors, uh, uh, the barriers and the drivers uh, about uh, the acceptance of, uh, of edible insects. And uh, um, so I was very uh, pleased to listen to all the speakers uh, this morning, and I'm really looking forward uh, for this discussion this afternoon. I think it will be very uh, beneficial, uh, um, very fruitful. So, um, as uh, Stefano said, we would like also to uh, do a round of the table uh, for, for you to present yourself. So, uh, if, we, if you want, we can, uh, we can start uh, uh, by, um, I don't know, like uh, alphabetical order. Yeah, let's go in alphabetical order. Yeah, we call them. Yeah, yeah I call. Uh, so, uh, let's. Um, so the first uh, would be uh, Maria Bartusova from um, the Slovak Medical University. Is is Maria present? Yeah, I'm here. Hello to everybody. I'm sorry, but my internet connection is very bad. So I hope that you can see me, but I hope that you can hear me. So I'm Maria Bartusova, and I'm a lecturer at the Department of Prevention and Clinical Medicine at Slovak Medical University in Bratislava, in Slovakia. And I'm uh, focused on uh, chronic diseases. So I'm uh, like an assistant professor. I have uh, lessons and lecture notes with the students. And it's uh, all about chronic diseases and prevention. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Um, the second presenter, Anita Jurik from the University of Mostar. Anita Jurik. Uh, oh. She's not present. Pilvi uh, Kempinen from EFSA. No, perhaps some people will join us later. Um, Gabriella Kowalska from Lodz University of Technology. Yes, hi. Um, hi. So it is really nice to see you guys. Um, 
Um, unfortunately, I don't know why I can't um, turn my camera on, uh, but it is really nice to see you. Um, uh, maybe I try later with my camera. So as you mentioned, I'm from Poland and um, I'm doing my PhD nowadays. Um, and my background is uh, chemistry of food. And the food chemistry, I had the opportunity to study in Berlin, in Germany, um, where I had uh, also a possibility to make a short um, scholarship at uh, BFR, which is also a part which makes lots of um, chemical analysis for EFSA. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriela. Um, then we have Pradip Kumar. Uh, I'm sorry for all these mis pronunciation of I'm doing, really sorry, from Hungarian University of, of Agriculture. Rather, perhaps he's not here. Okay. And then we move to Ner Nertila Kurai from University of Oslo. Hi, hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Salve a tutti. <laughs> it's a real pleasure to be here. I'm Yakila Kurai. I'm a postdoc fellow at the University of Oslo, and I'm currently working on a project concerning the regulation of synthetic biology in the EU and the US. And I have also a PhD on the regulation of uh, nanoscale chemicals within the European Chemicals Law, which is rich. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Karina Roberta Laia from the University of Bodenkultur. Yes. Hi, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for having me in this workshop. Uh, so, yeah, my name is Karina Laia and I'm a researcher assistant at the University of Natural Resources and Life Sciences in Vienna, Austria. And I'm also doing my uh, PhD in parallel. Uh, and I am analyzing uh, the ecological impact of um, novel or emerging technologies, and I'm focusing on GMOs and uh, the release of gene drives. Thank you. Thank you, Karina. Um, Joanna Leontio, Leon University of Edinburgh. No. Uh, Maria Victoria Lips. Okay. Rosaria Lucchini. Hello, everybody. I'm not Rosaria, but uh, we I'm are Rosaria. Rosaria. <laughs> we are both colleagues. We are working for uh, Institute for Health, uh, Animal Health uh, and Food Safety, Istituto Zooprofilattico delle Venezie. We are both involved uh, in food safety and uh, we are uh, involved in uh, the safety in lab in laboratory and uh, we are uh, a biology and a veterinarian and uh, that's all and uh, uh, biology and, uh... um next uh, uh, he is he is ma mame equa manful Um, no, we don't have. Uh, Concetta Milone from the University of Parma. No, oh, I'm sorry. I think uh, she is here. But ah, yes, yes. She's muted. Uh, sorry, hear. sorry. Please. Sorry. Uh, Mama, we don't hear you. Huh? Oh, yeah. Um, we cannot hear you. Um, I don't know. You have to unmute yourself. There is a bottom. Um, no, we cannot still hear you. No, it is the well, probably it's the bottom left. Uh... Yeah. Sorry if I, I mean, um, no, I think if she has unmuted herself, but maybe um, the computer does not recognize the microphone yeah. that she has chosen. So uh, okay. near the bottom, um, of near the in the footer where there is the bottom for mute and unmute, you should have an arrow, a small arrow. Can you see? Can you click on that arrow? A Windows? A win now, yes. Can you hear me now? I yes. think so, right? Yes. Okay, perfect. Hi guys. Yeah, so good afternoon, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you so much for your patience. Um, so I'm a PhD student at TU Dublin, Ireland. 
and my PhD is in um, food safety regulatory and market access of upcycled ingredients, uh, basically derived from olive, grape, and nut byproducts for nutraceutical and cosmetic applications. So I believe that this workshop is timely for my PhD because um, it's food safety and there's also the novel uh, ingredient aspect, and I'm also working in upcycled ingredients with a circular economy um, point of view. So I'm excited to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining. Um, then uh, Martina Nestrini from Luxembourg University of uh, Science and Technology. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Hello, everybody, and thank you. And uh, yes, I'm from Luxembourg. I am from LIST. And now I'm doing a PhD on free waste waste, in particular on ESG. And my project is about to find some new ingredient from residues in view of circular economy to products, food supplement or food additives. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you. And now Concetta Milone from University of Parma. Concetta, can you hear us? Well, she's there, I see her. But... Yeah, probably some uh, microphone issue, but we can get back uh, at the end. Uh, Alessandro Monaco. Yeah, nice uh, to meet uh, all of you. Nice to meet you. <laughs> I'm Alessandro. I'm a PhD candidate and a junior researcher at the University of Bayreuth. I have a background in gastronomic sciences and in the food law. And my current research is focused on the regulation of food innovations, in particular on those risk factors which require regulation. So that's why I'm here and I hope we will have a nice afternoon together. Thank you, Alessandro. Um... Ruzu Oana eh, Raluca. From uh, Yazi University of Lab Science. No? And uh, <clears throat> um, Fernando Ribeiro Pino. Yes. Do you hear me? Yes. So I'm Fernando, I'm from Spain. I am biotechnologist. I specialize in food technology and I did my PhD in chemistry in bioprocesses. And I started in May in EPSA as training in the Nobel Food team. Thank you, Fernando. Uh, Artis Robals from the Institute of Food Safety, uh, Animal Health and Environment, Bio. Hello, everyone. My name is Artis and I'm from Latvia. It's one of the Baltic uh, countries by the Baltic Sea, and I used to work with uh, biosorption and biosorbents, and it was about, uh, let's say, toxic or heavy metals, copper or chromium. But now my research is more focused on the recovery of uh, nutrients and uh, micro elements from some uh, food processing side streams. So I want to find out whether it's possible to use biosorbents to recover copper or zinc, and also proteins. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Stiliani Stella, uh, Stella Roufu, University of Malta. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello. Uh, thank you a lot for this opportunity and many congrats for this workshop. Uh, I am a PhD student and an early researcher from the University of Malta. I'm a food microbiologist and currently I'm focusing on the effect of climate change on the dairy industry. Thank you. Thank you, Stella. Uh, Marwa Schumo from uh, Postman, Germany. Hello, yes. Um, Hello. My camera also doesn't work. I don't know why, but um, I can see you and I hope you can hear me. Yes. Yes, um, my name is Marwa. I, I did my PhD in the use of the black soldier flies in bioconversion and livestock feed production. So I am um, an expert in the use of alternative proteins extracted from edible insects for food and feed. And I'm still working in the same field at the 
Institute of Agriculture Engineering and um, Leibniz Institute of Agriculture Engineering and Bioeconomy in Potsdam in Germany. Thank you. Uh, Erin Taskin from University Catholica. Hi, yes. Um, are you able to hear me? Yes. Okay, I'm a postdoc in agriculture and microbiology in Professor Cocconcelli's department. So I was just interested in this workshop, Novel Food and Technologies. I usually work on uh, metagenomics and uh, some biochemical indicators of soil quality and health uh, of smallholder farmers. And it was just interesting to join. And that's why I'm here with you to learn some more about Novel Foods and Technologies. Thank you. Thank you, Erin. Thank you very much. Finally, uh, Maria Vode Mikarova from Bulgaria. But I think she is not here. So, is there anyone who I did not mention connected? No? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Myself. Oh, sorry, sorry. I, I'm Lydia. I'm from Spain. Ah. Say yeah. Lydia, sorry. Uh, you join, yeah. yeah, I joined in the very last minute. <laughs> um, so I complete my PhD in March, uh, working with the characterization of novel enzymes with application in the food industry. And then uh, nowadays I'm an EFSA U4 a fellow, uh, working at the BFR in Berlin uh, in the topic of allergenicity to, to proteins of insects. Thank you. Thank you, Lydia. Thank you. Okay, so I think that, uh, um, so welcome again to everyone. Um, we, can, uh, we can start the workshop, which will be a very informal workshop. I uh, mean, uh, the, the atmosphere and the, the also the limited number of uh, participants uh, help us to, to discuss about uh, the, the topics in, um, covering this morning. Um, so uh, we will uh, start, uh, Stefano and I, we will start uh, with uh, a short, a brief uh, a summary and uh, perspective of what uh, has been discussed uh, this morning and also providing our own experience on this issue. And then uh, there will be uh, two, uh, two of you, uh, two presenters that uh, will, uh, will um, tell us about their projects. And uh, uh, we can uh, uh, discuss about uh, the project as well as any other topic that you want to raise uh, and uh, that uh, it's of interest for you. So, well, it is of course uh, uh, very difficult to uh, summarize uh, uh, the, this morning session uh, about, uh, about the novel food and novel technologies. Uh, we started uh, the morning with Christina Harmant uh, that uh, she provided an overview of this topic uh, and she reminded us uh, how uh, technologies, uh, novel technologies uh, in the food system has been always uh, present in all our history. No? So she, she started saying that uh, from the discovery of fire, for example, uh, and fermentation and uh, everything else, it was an, a new novel technology implemented in our food system. Um, and more recently, uh, we, we had uh, like uh, genetically modified uh, organism, uh, irradiation and other technologies uh, which create perhaps uh, a more uh, um, distance uh, between producers and, uh, and the consumers. And uh, uh, what she explained very well uh, were the main uh, um, barriers that consumers um, today have towards these novel foods. Uh, so these traits, individual traits, uh, such as foodnophobia, but also disgust, uh, uh, that in some way um, stop, uh, stop us to try the product. But at the same time, uh, she told us how um, showing uh, evidence uh, from uh, her experiment for, uh, and also other uh, authors, how uh, familiarity and exposure uh, towards this novel food, such as edible insects, for example, can uh, uh, increase the acceptance. So it is a very difficult, this cause what can tell us that it's very difficult with the hypothetical survey 
to make a prediction no, uh, for the real uh, acceptance because, uh, uh, I mean, one uh, thing is to fill out an uh, online survey about uh, the, the, the willingness to try, to, to pay, to buy, to purchase food. The other, on the other hand, when you try the food, when you actually have a, a consumption uh, um, and, and, uh, and purchasing uh, behavior, a real behavior, then uh, um, the exposure, the familiarity, the fact to create expectation towards this food allows you to make uh, more, uh, to, to, to create a prediction no more reliable, let's say. And so uh, she also discuss about not only food nephobia, which is a, which is a scale about uh, the, um, the approach to uh, avoid uh, novel food, uh, a new or to, 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 to avoid uh, yes, uh, novel food, but also the food technology nephobia. So more specific about these novel technologies uh, uh, related to food production. And uh, uh, she also concluded with this uh, new concept, uh, relatively new, the lack of naturalness. So the, the con considering a product na uh, natural or not uh, natural, and this, of course, it came uh, but this topic came back also during the, the other presentation, for example, the cultural meat uh, issue, uh, which is, uh, um, again, a new uh, concept, very important when we have to study consumers' behavior towards such novel foods, because in some cases, consumers, uh, even if they perceive some benefits, uh, nutritional benefits, sustainable benefits, they still perceive the foods or the way how the food was produced in some way unnatural. And here, of course, it opens very uh, philosophical questions about what is uh, nature, what is a natural process, and again, uh, this uh, uh, distance between scientists and consumers, the general public uh, and producers. So uh, these uh, the different stakeholders that, of course, uh, um, need to, to speak directly and to communicate uh, in a transparent way uh, their, uh, their um, their, their work. Uh, um, then uh, we, we have uh, the, the presentation uh, um, about, uh, more specifically about, uh, from Lynn Fluer uh, about uh, uh, GM technology and uh, gene editing. Um, so uh, Lynn explained uh, how this is not actually a new, a new issue about the, the acceptance of novel food because back in the latest, uh, late 90s, uh, um, with, the, with, the, with the new application of genetically modified organisms, so uh, the consumer concerns uh, raised, especially in the European Union. And uh, um, so she provided some example of GM, GM animals, you know, the aquabonti salmon, for example, uh, or uh, other uh, improvements of uh, and uh, modification of animals uh, to produce perhaps uh, fortified milk uh, or uh, other uh, other um, other um, yeah, benefits. And uh, she compared the concerns about GM uh, foods with the gene editing, which is. Uh, perhaps uh, in this field, the latest uh, um, breakthrough technology, uh, both for plants and animals. And she said that uh, um, she provided evidence, you know, of several works, and she, she said how this uh, concern uh, expressed uh, uh, with, uh, towards gene editing are very similar from the ones about the genetic uh, modified organism. Um, and finally, uh, regarding the, 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 the social, the social science uh, uh, aspect, uh, we had uh, uh, St Neil Stevens, uh, which provided a very well focused uh, uh, perspective on uh, cultural meat uh, from technical, social, and regulatory challenges uh, uh, regarding this uh, this um, new frontier of meat alternative alternatives, because. This was also mentioned by, for example, um, Andrea Germini, that the, the, the meat alternatives uh, uh, group uh, category 
uh, is one of the most uh, interest from a market point of view, from a consumer point of view. And so cultural meat is of course one of the answer to replace uh, um, meat uh, with, uh, with that artificial meat, uh, with all the several benefits of, from uh, animal welfare point of view and other benefits. But he also stressed how even if uh, in some countries is already uh, reality or a very close uh, reality, there are still some issues uh, regarding the production side and also the, uh, the naming, for example, how to name such products, you know, uh, how the name will affect consumer's behavior, how the names will affect uh, also the, the industry of meat. And this, is, this can be true both for the cultural meat and also for the other uh, plant-based meat uh, analogs that uh, there are so, uh, so um, growing, the market is so growing uh, recently. Um, so uh, this was uh, uh, the, the overview you know, from more a consumer acceptance uh, point of view. So I leave the floor to, to Stefano for uh, another synthesis of, of the topic. Yes, I will be much shorter actually. I will even try to make the overview of, from the technical side. Of course, as I said at the beginning, I'm a protein chemist, so I'm uh, more on the technical side. I think that uh, uh, the presentation of Andrea was uh, pretty, let's say, uh, enlightening on all the new trends. And we have heard a lot of novel foods that have been uh, approved lately, which, of course, as Andrea underlined, uh, we were never expected to become food, for example, alfalfa or caisis, but now they are in supermarket and, and they are there uh, to be sold as food. And then we heard about the new trends, uh, just mentioned a few, the oligosaccharides, meaning king, uh, the oligosaccharides in the human milk, uh, the sugar substitute, uh, uh, the nanomaterials. Uh, so some of them are actually mimicking things that exist, but other of them are clearly novel in the sense that uh, uh, they have never been eaten. And, and uh, I also had a part on the synthetic biology, which is less my field, but uh, of course, this is also uh, something which was very enlightening to me. And if I should summarize, I try to make uh, uh, a general comment here, is uh, the impression that I got, and I think uh, we can all share this impression, is that science in general is proceeding very fast and is opening for all of us uh, let's say, path to foods which were simply unthinkable, uh, well, a bit older than, uh, than the average here, <laughs> simply unthinkable 20 or 30 years ago. So today we have the possibility to consider food, uh, things that were not even possible. And I'm mostly thinking to synthetic biology, where we can even produce new living organisms starting from the technique uh, of uh, manipulating uh, DNA. So the impression that I have as a, as a technical professional, so I'm not involved in consumer science, but as a technical professional, the impression that I have is that uh, we have a, a lot of possibilities and the science is proceeding fast. Another impression that I have, you may challenge me on that uh, lately because most of you are studying in the field, is that uh, we basically do, we, I mean, I include EFSA, but also all the science produced in the world. Uh, we basically do a quite proper job in assessing the risk. I mean, uh, all the procedure that we set up, uh, particularly in the European legislation, which is the most strict in the world for food safety, and sometimes somebody might argue even a bit too strict, uh, but uh, we really do a good job, and that's of course is the top of it, do, they do a good job in uh, assessing the risk. What we professional from the technical side sometimes perceive, and I think this morning we have a good impression is like, I'm trying to simplify a lot. So I say something which maybe is a bit extreme, but try to uh, get the main message. Science is not really a problem. Assessing the risk more or less is not a problem. Consumer acceptance, so the penetration in the market, of, it is a problem. Sometimes in a way that we, let's say, art scientists have a difficulty to understand. Uh, something that for us is perfectly eatable, is safe, and then suddenly it's stuck because there is problem, legal problem, consumer acceptance problem. So I really see a gap here. And I think this uh, workshop, uh, particularly this morning, sorry, this uh, summer school, particularly this morning, enlightened very well 
this is a kind of gap here. So science, I, I tried to use a, a slogan, maybe a bit too simplistic, but uh, science is going faster than the consumers. And uh, uh, I, I'm not sure that uh, this is good in general for the European, uh, uh, let's say, food market. If you have uh, anybody of uh, in the audience has a direct question to uh, Karina and Tila on uh, their specific presentation, but then maybe Giovanni Mi will try to enliven a bit the discussion, also trying to start you from this presentation and to enlarge a bit uh, the uh, vision. But uh, at the moment, I would say if somebody of you, anybody has questions strictly related to the pre presentation, maybe it's a moment to do them. And uh, before we, let's say, start for a much larger trip. <laughs> Nobody? Well, I actually have one for everybody, to be honest, very strict uh, to the presentation. Uh, the first maybe for Nertila uh, about synthetic biology. Uh, putting all together, uh, just a very, let's say, a quick uh, legal assessment. <laughs> uh, do you foresee an easier penetration in the market uh, for synthetic biology products? Uh, United States or European Union? From all, all you say, I think I got it. But uh, if you have to put all together, do you foresee in five years uh, synthetic biology products more easily present in the US or in the EU market? Uh, definitely not in the EU, I would say, because as I said, the synthetic biology, unlike traditional or recombinant DNA uh, techniques, sometimes involves like chemically synthesized DNA starting from computer models. So in terms of consumer perception, it's even more unnatural and uncertain. So we can debate whether this uncertainty is real or is just perceived, uh, but it is a very, uh, it, we can say that this, uh, the addressing of uncertainty by the regulatory bodies, both the EFSA and the Commission in this case, is key to consumer acceptance in Europe, and it goes both ways. So EFSA and the Commission should also listen to uh, the consumers or to the states. That's why we have this deadlock for authorizing even traditional GMOs. So I don't see a possibility no, yeah, in the near actually, future. Yeah, I, I got it well, yes. I, yeah. Actually, I'm, I'm really un-European in this because I'm a strong opposer of the precautionary principle. So <laughs> yeah. I'm, in, I'm probably in the wrong continent, but uh, anyway, no, but, I, I, that, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's I what I got. <laughs> yeah, maybe for CRISPR products, even though I'm not certain about it, because as I said, you have different techniques, but when you use CRISPR and you simply uh, delete or remove certain uh, uh, um, the bases or other letters in the DNA code, for example, without introducing new genetic material, Perhaps there can be an opening to that, but even that I don't see, uh, I don't see like a, a moving towards the US approach, let's say. It's what Norway is actually trying with this initiative that I just mentioned, and it is really kind of uh, surprising that a country like Norway will enact such a, uh, such a proposal. But at the same time, if you think about the, the fact that they depend on uh, oil reserves, and oil is a controversial <laughs> uh, kind of source of wealth and of uh, revenue now, then maybe they are looking for a new uh, sacred grail yeah. <laughs> somehow. But of course, <laughs> for scientists, the situation... I, actually, is... I fully agree with you, and I think I got it well, that uh, yeah. the, the Europe will be the most, uh, let's say, conservative market for this kind of things, and again, Reconnecting what we were saying before, again, another occasion which science goes much faster than what society can absorb, basically, at least in Europe, I'm not sure in the United States. Uh, my question to Karina actually is, uh, maybe goes in the same direction, actually. Uh, to me, your approach of non-safety uh, issue for GMOs is actually extremely interesting. But, it, uh, uh, but there is no but. Actually, it is very interesting. It is a nice way to expand uh, the scope of the assessment of a GMO. And uh, to me, it looks like, but correct me if I'm wrong, as a way to convince uh, the consumer that actually we, as uh, let's say, as assessors, uh, we are doing a very true, a very good job in assessing everything, not only safety. So it looks to me, but correct me if I'm wrong, uh, and a, a way to try to convince, again, I would say, the European consumer the GMO is actually worthwhile to be at least uh, considered. So my objection, no, not to you, but basically to European consumers, is uh, your approach is extremely rational. But the opposition of GMOs in uh, Europe, and particularly in Southern Europe, is 
very much based on the emotional grounds. So do you think that your approach will actually be able to convince more consumers to accept GMOs or it will be, uh, let's say, <laughs> another attempt, uh, but a uh, failed attempt? Uh, what do you assess these kind of things? Yeah, uh, thank you for, for your question. Um, so uh, this approach is more for, for the assessors in order to aid for a decision in the approval of uh, a GMO. So it's, it's not uh, for the consumers directly. Um, um, but maybe you can and... use the argument, well, we did a very, very, very good job in assessing everything. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> Um, but I think that, so it's just a, a 1st step or a 1st try, let's say, to kind of try to expand and see how uh, such an assessment would look like. And I think that it still uh, has a way to go. Um, but um, it's not, it's not necessarily to kind of convince them of a certain GMO, but is to actually assess the, the impact of the, the potential GMO um, made them be negative or positive. Um, and um, it's, it's, yes, as you said, like, it's, uh, it's very more emotion uh, driven uh, or so. And here we're trying to be a little bit, um, which is very difficult to combine um, as um, these, these two fields of ethics and uh, emotion-driven, uh, value-based with um, pure scientific evidence. Yeah. So, so your answer basically is that it is for professional, but not really for the broader audience. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yes. If I can join on this, uh, Stefano, I actually had uh, yeah, a clarification uh, to Karina about this um, Tire 1 uh, questionnaire uh, to assess. I mean, this was... Uh, aim to, for the assessors to identify, I mean, not for consumers, uh, for the general public, right? Indeed. Yes, for the assessors. Okay, so the, 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 the parts regarding the ethical uh, uh, issues uh, related to uh, GM uh, technology, uh, how, is going, how is going to be asked, uh, how is going to be measured, uh, using the assessors? Um, well, uh, these uh, ethical questions, um, they um, kind of go a little bit around throughout the whole questionnaire. It has a bit of a, a tendency to allude to um, ethical considerations. Uh, so what the assessor uh, would have to do or how it's envisioned at the moment is to answer some questions um, and uh, to uh, to answer them by first, what is the likelihood of such an impact? And then what is uh, the, the severity or the, the quality of such an impact? Um, and then for them to uh, give reasons uh, for their choice. So it's more a uh, semi-qualitative, uh, a semi-quantitative, sorry, um, where they have, it's a uh, multiple choice and they have, okay, uh, this uh, it has like a low likelihood or high likelihood or something like that. Um, and uh, regarding the, uh, how they're gonna to assess the ethics, um, it's, um, hopefully through experience and through using uh, of, of this uh, approach and through um, what um, 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 results already are there in uh, literature or in previous assessments, they can kind of give, a, give an answer. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Karina. Thank you. I hope I, I answered your yeah. question. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, we, we can open the floor to, to discussion to everyone. So, um, is there any, is, uh, any other comment on the issues just covered or any other thoughts about uh, the, this morning sessions uh, or uh, related to your uh, projects uh, that you want to address?
And the Y Stefano has some uh, <laughs> nice. Oh, actually, I have a new one which actually was inspired uh, both by Karina and Nertila. And, and this is going to be a question to everybody. So, uh, everybody forming an opinion, please uh, share your opinion with me. And I think that uh, most of you are in the youngest part of your, your career, many of you are PhD or postdoc. So, that's even more interesting to me because, of course, uh, we all people actually have, uh, let's say, crystallized opinion, but I think uh, your point of view can be different. And actually, the point uh, was given both by, uh, actually, as I say, Nertila and Karina. Nertila said uh, about these two cultures that are present at the beginning. So, the, and we always reason it this way, the legal and the communicators against, uh, or not really against, uh, and uh, together with the hard science, uh, more or less like Giovanni and me today, and, uh, but also, actually, also Karina said at a certain point, the need to find a common language. So my provocative question actually to everybody is, in our PhD course, we tend to be very much structured on our specific expertise. If I have a PhD in chemistry, even if I work on uh, novel foods, I'm very probably very much focused on the chemistry of novel foods, uh, and it's very likely that I will never, almost never be exposed to the consumer acceptance or to the legal parts. And I, I suspect that from the other side is more or less the same. While you may have a lot of legal and consumer acceptance, but sometimes you don't get into the tiny details uh, of the chemistry and the biology. So my provocative question to everybody of you actually, do you think there is a need in, in the PhD course uh, to educate people a bit on the border? Of course, if, if it is a PhD in chemistry, it's in chemistry. But maybe inserting some training one month or two months in the legal aspects uh, or in the consumer acceptance stuff. Uh, Davide, in the closure of the, co of the conference, say something similar, actually. I quote you, Davide, uh, my colleague, Davide Menotti, say that, that we should uh, be able to raise our head from the analytical stuff and uh, look at the broader picture. This, to me, looks a direct message to the art scientists that don't look only at the art science. Maybe we can even revert on the other side. Do not only look at the consumer acceptance, only, only look at the legal. Just watch a bit on the analytical tools, on the chemical tools. So the general question to everybody, and mostly to the youngest one, is that do you feel that uh, in your specific PhD course you want to be educated a little bit also on the other side, or you think that I'm happy the way it is, I want to learn the chemistry and then there will be time to learn about legal and consumer. So I would likely ask everybody to tell their opinion on that. Of course, don't be shy. We are in a very small environment. Maybe David already has a, an opinion on that. <laughs> okay, it's up to you guys. I just want to specify that it was not directly referred to the hard scientist, but also to the social scientists. Is, uh, comment <laughs> I, I can start on that if that is okay because i, I see the end of uh, karina yes uh, or maybe it's uh, from um, before no maybe you no, forgot no it's it's a it's a new <laughs> race it's a new hand okay, for, yeah. okay. <laughs> yes thank you uh sorry Nadia, but if you want to start uh, no, it's okay. go ahead. No, I just agree uh, <laughs> okay it's perfect all right uh so if i would just i can just talk from my own experience uh regarding your question uh, so I started out um, doing um, uh, biology, so more on the natural science part, and then I I, uh, I studied environmental science, which is kind of somewhere in between uh, social and natural sciences. And now, when working um, in in project, uh, I I felt the need to kind of like quickly put myself up to date with all of the all of the the legal requirements and law. And, and so on, which uh, sometimes is a bit difficult because it has its own language. And coming from biology um, and ecology, uh, actually it was a little bit. So I think that having some transdisciplinary courses at the PhD level, but starting even earlier, uh, in my opinion, at master's level, I think it would be a definitely added value. Yeah. Thank you. 
Nabila, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I can uh, echo that in that it is very, I, I think it's no, no cho we have no choice but to go towards uh, multidisciplinarity or interdisciplinarity because uh, the two culture that I mentioned before, there is a very beautiful uh, essay from uh, C.P. Snow, uh, which kind of explains how this uh, two cultures divide is a loss for both scientific community and for the social science community. That's why we should find a way to bridge this uh, divide and to find a way to speak to each other. And I don't think that in certain discipline you really have a choice. For example, my PhD was on nanochemical regulation. And to make the case that reach uh, the European uh, chemicals law does not offer a high level of protection for human health and environment for this class of chemicals, I had to go into the science of nanotechnology and what are nanochemicals and why Nano silver is not the same as silver. I mean, even as a lawyer, I had to do this study. And of course you have a lot of issue because some would say like in the US it's much more common to have this interdisciplinary background. Um, in Europe, not so common, but still, and there is debate whether you can attain interdisciplinarity only by studying the subject yourself or whether you need a double degree. So there is this, some scholar will say that uh, if you do a, a proper work, you can study enough uh, of the scientific part in my case to kind of uh, build a legal, legal analysis on that and in doubt you can always hold like workshops when you put uh, what you have researched about on the science uh, to the scientists for them to kind of say okay this is fine or <laughs> you have completely misunderstood the, the science and I think that the net confrontation that happens between uh, lawyers uh, or social science in general and um, natural scientists is uh, on the precautionary principle. This is a, perhaps like the most misunderstood, <laughs> I can say you kind of <laughs> detest the concept, but it's in certain legal circles, it's really kind of well regarded. Uh, because of course we, like if you go to the uh, semantic of, uh, of the world, precaution is care basically. So you can have, <laughs> you can have a whole philosophical discussion of like how to use uh, care in uh, decision making. and. I mean, I think precaution is the, it really encapsulates the real spirit of science. It's not anti-scientific because science proceeds by trial and error. Science is not kind of, uh, you know, uh, it's set in stone, you know, things evolve. I mean, this is not to deny <laughs> the uh, nature of science, but things evolve. And the precautionary principle is based on the idea that when we have more information, then we should adjust our decision making uh, to that information. But it also says that sometimes, we can, depending on the type of uncertainty that is at stake, because we can have uncertainty when we know what, what, when we, what we don't know, which is the strictly understood uncertainty when we can address, which we can address in the regulatory risk assessment. We have, uh, we don't know what we don't know, which is kind of ignorance. And probably we have uh, indeterminacy we will never know for certain issues. So it is not an issue that you generate more information even in a risk assessment and you will solve an issue. And we are seeing this problem with complex nanochemicals, but also endocrine disruptors. I mean, I asked a question about the fact that even the endocrine society uh, is deeming this class of chemical to be dangerous regardless of those. And the EFSA risk assessor said, oh no, but we need to take those into consideration when we perform exposure assessment, which is fine. But the fight in the, on the regulatory uh, level about endocrine disruptors is that to classify certain chemicals as endocrine disruptors, you don't need to take into consideration those. You know? And there is a big difference where certain information comes in into the regulatory process. So uh, problem formulation, risk characterization, exposure assessment, uh, yeah, well, and I fully agree with you that uh, there is a lot of confusion. So, and I think many times uh, precautionary principle is only being used to to block things without any uh, clear reason. But I see a raised hand from Alessandro. The one, uh, please. <laughs> yeah, thank you, uh, Stefano. Uh, no, I just uh, wanted to give an opinion and also ask a question. Uh, so first, uh, let's say the opinion uh, and. Um, as you said, uh, I am at the start of my PhD career, but I would say that my background and my PhD project uh, uh, itself is a good representation of it. Uh, I'm always being involved in interdisciplinary research uh, and so on. And so I completely agree with uh, uh, Nertila about this problem of uh, expertise, so to say. So when you, when you discuss something with lawyers, uh, you're not uh, enough a lawyer. When you discuss something with a scientist, uh, 
you usually don't know enough about the scientific stuff. So I think that interdisciplinary um, research uh, or um, in general, it, it's a very good thing, but uh, it's also difficult for a uh, for, uh, for person uh, in the middle. So to have an interface with, uh, with everyone else. Um, and I also have uh, a question. Uh, so going back to uh, the presentations maybe, um, in my opinion, we see that uh, when it comes to GMOs, uh, G gene editing uh, techniques, uh, um, and uh, as we saw also this morning, uh, uh, naturalness is uh, a criteria used by consumers, by the general public uh, to ask for more regulation. Um, and uh, this is uh, something comprehensible in my opinion, because uh, people uh, tend to fear what they don't know, as we learned uh, today, and so it, it's completely understandable. But my question for you would be, uh, if we don't adopt uh, a criteria like uh, naturalness, uh, what, what would be a scientific uh, criteria for the regulation of uh, GMOs or gene editing? I mean, where would you cross the line if it was up to you? Shall I go first? Yeah, yes. I think we can refer to the European Court of Justice sentence from 2012, which established that mutagenesis, uh, new mutagenesis techniques and products obtained through new mutagenesis techniques are to be subjected to GMO regulation because uh, according to the court, only uh, mutagenesis techniques that have been in use prior to 2000 to the year 2000 and the, or 2001 when the directive came into force, uh, had a long enough safety record. So one of the criteria that is actually used uh, regardless of the naturalness uh, criteria is whether or not a certain uh, practice has a long enough uh, history of, sa of safe use. So um, synthetic biology or even CRISPR uh, don't have this actually but of course you can, so this is another criteria. If there is a safe history of use, you can, according like to uh, official ruling, you can, um, you can exempt certain uh, technologies or sensor products for regulation. Uh, but of course scientists disagree uh, uh, with this because they are saying that even though CRISPR and mostly CRISPR don't have a safe history of use, uh, they uh, enable very fast and very precise uh, mutations in the DNA uh, and this eliminates some of the problems which technologies that even though have a safe uh, a long or a safe uh, history of safe use uh, still cause like for example all techniques of mutagenics through chemical radiation they cause kind of uh, off-target mutations so uh, there is still a debate on this whether we should consider the safe history of use or whether we should consider new criteria like uh, the speed or high, uh, the high precision of the technology because one part is saying that uh, speed and high precision shouldn't e uh, equal uh, safe so hmm. well, the safe history of use is one of the criteria yeah. Yeah. Uh, well my, my opinion maybe is not so precise on the on, as, as uh, Lutila. Uh, if you are by the way to everybody uh, if you have opinion please raise your hands uh, we want to hear you, not really us, <laughs> but uh, just very quick as a scientist, uh, I will be, I think safety is, is, our, uh, all, is our only beacon to follow. Uh, safety following a proper risk assessment, considering the rational risk and the risks which are logical. That's it, to be honest, and I know that I'm very outside any kind of European approach here, so that's really my opinion. If the product uh, has a proper risk assessment and is uh, demonstrated to be safe by any rational ground, I don't really care if it is new or it is a traditional Easter fuse. Also, natural to me is a word that is very difficult to demonstrate. Uh, even things that the general people tend to consider natural, what is natural in creating a breed of cows that cannot even give birth to, to the calf because the calf is too big? Uh, to, to, and they always have to go to zero section, like the uh, the big Belgian cows. And uh, what is natural in that? So I think natural is also something that's very difficult to define scientifically. So I would really stick to safety. That's the only thing that can, that is important. We have to demonstrate that is safe at our best possible uh, way. And of course, not in, zero risk does not exist. So errors are done. We have to correct along the way. But uh, that's, sorry. 
up to somebody else. <laughs> Well, Stefano, if uh, I, I agree with you, I mean, about the, the lack of uh, the, the concept of what is natural, uh, this is a natural food. Ah, there is a hand. Uh, Sorry, I don't know how to write my hand. Okay, I actually even do it. Most of Alessandro, but I think we can let this ah, first. So, sorry. No, no, it's fine. Uh, I, I'm okay. sure Alessandro has something to say, but uh, first Martina, then Alessandro. Okay. If okay for uh, Alessandro, of course. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. I just want to say that also I agree with uh, the first question that you posed because actually I also started my PhD one year ago. So maybe it could be useful to follow some courses about legal or not just legal law, maybe also on commercial or we can say real world in order to be in line or what people that doesn't know a lot uh, of science can understand, try to find a link. So try to learn how to find this link from the science side. But also maybe as Karina said before, maybe before also the PhD, maybe during the university directly. And also I was thinking about bioinformatics. Times ago, there was informatics and biologists. And now they start to, I would say, to burn this new figure is it the bioinformatician. So maybe try to um, add more courses at the university, maybe in, uh, my, I think in both sides, science, university, scientific university, but also um, economy or I don't know, uh, other kind of university to try to find a link in, in this way is really interdisciplinary and also yes that's one thing and the other thing is also to try actually to increase the trust on people because there is also these things that people that doesn't know a lot of science or uh, research and maybe think that is really far away from their life. So try to really um, show that research is practical for the, the real world, to improve the real world, not just to do research uh, as it. So it's also to educate researcher to ex better explain maybe the, the research and educate people to understand and to be opener to the research. So I move. Well, and now I'm going to give the word to Alessandro, but uh, to be honest, I'm going to feel very old here. Uh, after I, I'm, I'm definitely more than 50, I lost a bit of hope in educating people. Maybe I should not say that, but I was there in the 90s. You were not there. Uh, I was there in the 90s where the, the, OG, the GMOs started to be discussed. And immediately the discussion went completely out of any rationale. They start to talk about uh, Frankenstein food, about it, and the discussion was immediately above any rational level. So the, it's not that you can, you, we, we, we were not trying to educate people. I explained, I don't know many times what GMOs were, what the risks were, but it was simply like, is a natural, is a monster, it does not exist. And it's, I really, in the moment, maybe I'm, I'm a scientist, so I'm not a professional, uh, let's say communicator, and maybe that was my bad. Uh, but I, I really found really impossible, really difficult to educate people that does not want to be educated. They start with their own idea, uh, uh, which starts not from the brain but from the gut. And at that at that point, any rational discussion is over. But that's is my pessimistic old age. I, I, I'm happy that the young people still think that there is a, a possibility to educate person. Sorry, Alessandro, it was up to you. And then I see Karina also again. Okay. Um, uh, thank you, Stefano. Um, now I just wanted to, to thank you for your answers and maybe I wanted to elaborate a little more on that. Um, so basically, um, um, Nertila, you proposed uh, to adopt this, uh, for example, this history of uh, safe use uh, as, a, as a criteria, no? um, while uh, Stefano was more on the 
overall safety of the product. Um, in my opinion, the problem with novelty is that uh, it is uh, still something which is uh, legally arbitrary. Arbitrary. So you just uh, set the line, and uh, of course, the scientists will disagree about what is an history of safe use, and uh, they could, for example, I guess. Uh, uh, an opinion could be where well, something is safe, uh, we don't need 25 years to demonstrate it uh, if we are uh, totally sure that something uh, is uh, safe. And uh, in relation to that, uh, um, I wanted to ask uh, also a, a further question. If we um, arrive at the point in which we have to assess every single time that something is safe, uh, don't we lose the match uh, in any case? Because we all know how difficult it is to conduct a risk assessment, no? So when it comes to a novel food like like an insect, for example, if we continue to go uh, with this uh, authorization system uh, uh, for every single use, for every single species, uh, for every single not not feed, but uh, we are more or less there. Uh, I mean, uh, we lose a lot of time uh, to demonstrate uh, what we already know, basically every time for years and uh, you know thousands of. Uh, of uh, euros spent uh, every single time. Good consideration, actually. <laughs> okay, Karina, it, it is up to you. Yes, thank you. I just had a, a very short comment uh, to what you said, uh, Stefano, uh, about uh, science communication. Um, and I think that um in general um as scientists it's very hard to to explain just uh the the public or lay people exactly what we're doing and uh what how all the the intricate mechanisms of everything so i think the science communication is it is the most important because we work in in the world right and we have to explain i mean one one really big current example is is the vaccine and the pandemic i mean there's so many theories going out there right and it's just because of i mean not just because but it's science communication as well yeah that was my my short comment if i can add something on that um the safe history of use is it's already codified in the legislation so <laughs> it's not like a, a toy so and i agree that risk assessment and this is the argument made in the us that the european risk assessment is extremely lengthy extremely expensive extremely kind of uh, detailed and time consuming but at the same time uh, i think we go back to the initial kind of confrontation between law and science because when we speak about gmo i mean we are speaking about a very specific risk which is perhaps not common to every other scientific endeavor because uh, as one of the and i know that this will so sound like as irrational <laughs> for some of you here as one of the main figures during the recombinant dna debate erwin shargaff said that you can find can kind of undo a lot of scientific uh, processes for example you can stop going to the moon he said you can stop splitting the atom you can stop killing a population by the drop of a few bombs but you can never recall a new form of life so uh, this might be perceived as rational by some but actually he is a scientist he was a scientist and he was kind of fundamental to the uh, dna uh, science uh, during those years and of course he was a little bit kind of uh, maybe too much on the social science uh, part, but it's true that we can never recall a new form of life. And if we think about CRISPR, one of the main issues that is kind of driving the controversy now is the fact that the new forms of life edited through CRISPR are currently undetectable, most of them. Because in the GMO risk assessment, you have to provide um, um, methods uh, through which you detect, so it's possible to detect the genetic event that has been introduced in the plant through current methodologies. But for CRISPR plants and animals and other microorganisms, this is not currently possible. And some are saying, okay, but this is proof that these are completely natural. So they are closest to the natural counterpart. But others are saying, what if something goes wrong? You cannot even, you know, uh, find this uh, CRISPR plants because there is no way to detect the events, even though there are some advances in uh, bioinformatics which should help in that regard. 
So I think we should keep in mind that it's a very kind of uh, close to the heart risk, food, life, and so on. But I know that for scientists it sounds different perhaps. So. Can I, uh, can I pose a question based on the comments of Stefano before about the fact that, and I, I'd like to address it first perhaps to David, uh, Professor Menozzi, but of course it's open, uh, it's open to everyone, of course. But like what uh, Stefano said before that, uh, mm, uh, I mean, I'd like, I like, let's say that uh, I understand that he is, uh, um, uh, sickness of uh, educating, try, trying to educate people, consumers, uh, let's say in, uh, in our case, uh, to acceptance of novel technology or at least uh, about the safety of novel technologies. And uh, he made the case of uh, the GM acceptance uh, uh, in the 90s. And I know that Professor Menozzi has worked extensively on the GM acceptance with, this, uh, with the research on uh, social side, using social side techniques and so on and so forth. So I was wondering what is uh, perhaps different now, 2021 compared to the 90s in terms of uh, like communication, I'm referring for example, social media uh, or fake, and fake news in general, and also based on the, um, based also based on the the, the listeners, I mean, the, the general public, uh, uh, we are not the people from the 90s. Uh, uh, so uh, in the sense that uh, um, perhaps there are more, uh, uh, there is more information about, uh, about uh, the role of science compared to the past, uh, or on the other hand, there, is more, there are more fake news. Uh, it's like the case of uh, vaccine, as I said before. So what is the, the perspective for you is more positive or negative compared in the past? Well, um, I was there in the 90s as well. <laughs> I was a student actually. <laughs> but, uh, well, uh, there are also, I think there are a few papers, I don't remember exactly, but uh, uh, trying to expose the analyzing what went wrong in the communication about uh, GMOs uh, during the 90s. I, and if I well remember, they were uh, emphasizing the, the role of the, um, of the NGOs in this, uh, in particular Greenpeace or other uh, environmental organizations really uh, had a role in, uh, uh, let's say, influencing the, uh, the public perce perception in this kind of context. And um, so, yes, today the, the the, I think that the, I'm not an expert on that, but the communication arena is completely different now compared to the 90s. We didn't have internet so <laughs> in the 90s, so uh, we were informed by, by papers, which is, of course, out of time now. Um, so two completely different uh, contests. contexts. Um, so I, I, it's hard to say how what lesson should be learned by that context, which is uh, completely out of time, as I said. So uh, one thing that I might suggest to young sci scientists is, um, um, of course, to improve the communication, uh, your communication skills. Um, nowadays, we have, of course, the scientific papers, but more and more we are asked to have to have these uh, uh, graphical abstracts. Uh, we are able to use uh, several uh, online tools for, uh, with graphic representations of the data, easier to understand also for the lay people. And um, my suggestion also when I, when I make a presentation in, for general public or even for students, which are not already uh, skilled in, in some kind of uh, uh, let's say arguments. I, I try to be as simple as simple as possible, uh, which doesn't mean being simplistic. I don't know if it's the right uh, term in, in English, but uh, you probably understand me. Um, it means uh, uh, be uh, empathetic with the audience and, and ask yourself: Do my father or my mother or my grandpa and my, gra my grandma would understand me 
so this is one point. The second point uh, to build trust, which is again another very complex is issue, how to build trust in the in the in society. Uh, there are of course uh, degrees about that. So, um, but one focal thing is uh, to be transparent. And this is also probably that was missing at that time during the 90s, also because of uh, yeah, uh, or logistics reasons. There was not the, the media that we have today. Uh, so being transparent means uh, uh, don't hide anything. So we saw, for instance, from uh, Christina's uh, presentation today that one of the uh, most unnatural product is uh, uh chicken uh how do you call it chicken uh, nuggets you know uh processed meat uh, why basically because the people doesn't understand how they do that uh, the people doesn't understand what happened in the in the in the in a factory and the factory doesn't open their uh, their uh, doors to do to show that you know so uh, so transparency is a key factors for the, for the companies for also for the scientists uh, from my point of view and um, i wanted to say something else but i forgot it because i'm old and uh... <laughs> yes. Please, uh, Please, Martina. Martina. yes i just want to add something to what uh, neltila Says before on safety because uh, now actually I'm not working with the GMO or this in uh, in this subject, but during my university during my thesis I did uh, genome editing, and what I can say, I may make now some mistake to say something because in this year something changed, but actually. It's true that um, it's necessary to follow say, safety regulation and everything, but if we compare the cross plants or animals, sorry, I am a plant biotechnologist, so I talk about plants, and uh, genome editing, actually when you cross two organisms, you don't know which kind of gene can be uh, link to another you actually really don't know is a random uh, cross or uh, if you use a physic approach to modify the dna when you use a genome editing you know exactly when you go and then if you want to see if the plant is uh, is good or not if actually the modification is there or not you can use some technique like PCR or a sequence to see effectively if there is a mutation there or not. So in this point of view, I think, and I don't know, yeah, I think, yeah, I find safer doing um, genome editing that uh, apply physics like uh, Ray, to modify randomly DNA or uh, cross for five years one uh, plant with another to try to give this, uh, I don't know, this try one skill <laughs> or like that. So maybe also it's important to take into account that genome editing or these new technologies could be safer in the, in the view of precision there are more, uh, they can select and choose what you want to modify. And in this case, also to, for a safe assessment, regulation, everything could be also easier to find if there is a mutation or not, what is going out and that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Martina. Shall I comment on that? Or? Yeah, please. No, I was just, yeah, I was just going to say that, um, this will go back to the usual like confrontation of uh, social science and science because for social science and for law like uh, precision or high speed of uh, modification does not equate to, to safety because for example and or uh, because before i forgot also like what 
went wrong or what we should not do in order not to have consumer resistance. Perhaps a show like uh, the technology should be, the, the market readiness of the technology should be properly assessed because um, there were some incidents during the GMO uh, debates in the 90s, like the ice minus incident in California that is part of some controversy. So uh, not to proceed with the technology until, uh, you know, not only safety is established, but also the consumers have enough knowledge about it. Because what happened with CRISPR, as you may know, is that uh, while there was a second uh, summit about human germline editing, one of the presenters came on stage. There was a kind of, not a moratorium, but actually there was an agreement not to proceed with heritable uh, human uh, genome editing until we know more about the technology. And then one of the presenters, uh, um, a Chinese researcher, came on stage and said that he had already used a CRISPR to edit the genome of, genome of twin babies. So they were the first CRISPR baby. And of course, this kind of sparked outrage because you know, the scientific community was going, not the legal one, the scientific community was going in one direction and then uh, some scientists just came in and he just had his hand on the technology uh, before it was ready. So I think there are a lot of issues to take into consideration. And to go back uh, to uh, Martina's question, like, of course, I mean, it's time consuming and there is a perceived like safety uh, about like uh, targeted gene editing. Uh, but actually, I mean, there is no, it, it's like equating like the proof, equating like the uncertainty or like the lack of proof on risk to safety. And this is not done in the, in the legal domain. So I think there should be an open discussion about that because so, uh, as it was mentioned before by Karina, there was this very interesting report on ethics on genome editing, which it's really nice to read. When they go to the safety question, they say, okay, but we operate on a safe enough concept in our regulations. So, but safe enough for who? Because think of synthetic biology, but it's not only like safety per se, but impact that they can have. Like Europe is so kind of uh, not risk prone because the agriculture in Europe is very different from the American one, which is very intensive, uh, owned by big corporations. So it can have like the acceptance of certain technologies can have impacts. Uh, also in the way people live and their relationship to land and to food, actually. So synthetic biology vanillin, for example, might be ma more sustainable than the artificial like chemical one, but it can have a very negative impact on the communities uh, of farmers that grow vanilla in Madagascar. So we have to consider like the holistic. I think another term in addition to interdisciplinarity is like a holistic approach to risk and safety. Okay. 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 Yeah, yeah, thanks for, uh, for your contribution, uh, contribution and uh, comments. Uh, I think that we are uh, yeah, over 5 p.m., we're a little bit over 5, uh, so we are going to conclude this session, this afternoon session. However, I think that uh, it uh, raised a lot of uh, no question, open questions uh, and for uh, future uh, discussion. So I think that uh, uh, you can also share your contact no, with, the, with the, your colleagues that, uh, of this afternoon and uh, keep on uh, this debate uh, in um, order. So, um, on behalf of the, of the scientific and organizing committee, uh, myself, Stefano, Professor Sforza, uh, Professor Menozzi, uh, we can uh, officially close the summer school this afternoon uh, session. So th thank you again for your uh, uh, participation of this afternoon. Thanks for the presenters, of course, and for uh, everyone else uh, uh, who, who joined uh, uh, today and uh, during the last three days of, uh, of this uh, summer school. So thanks. Thank you. I hope Bye. to see you, thank you. in person uh, in, the, in the near future. Thank, thank you very you much. Thank you for organizing. Bye. Thank you for everybody.